All right, great. Let's get started. Um, <laughs> okay, so today uh, we are going to talk about constituency parsing. Before that, I wanted to go over the exam uh, problems just briefly. Uh, as I mentioned last time, we're still grading those. Hopefully we can be done soon, but it's a kind of slow process. Um, but just in case you're wondering about um, the answers to these questions. Um, all right, I assume this is on my screen. Yeah, okay. So the first question here uh, was about prompt-based learning. Um, and it had three parts. So the first part was essentially asking you, given some continuous prompt, and remember here we're using this prompt tuning framework in which a prompt is like a hundred learned embeddings. Um, is it possible to recover the performance of that continuous prompt with some arbitrary discrete prompt? And the question says, you're able to enumerate every single possible discrete prompt in an effort to find one that at least matches or outstrips the performance of the continuous prompt. Um, and the answer to this is no. You cannot, you're not guaranteed to find um, a discrete prompt that is equivalent or better to the continuous prompt because the discrete prompts are restricted in the vector space of the embeddings, right? Each embedding has to be from the learned word embedding um, or subword embedding or whatever um, uh, uh, parameters of the base language model. A continuous prompt has no such constraints, and so those learned embeddings can be from anywhere. Okay, um, and then the second question. Uh, there's a little bit of, oh yeah, you had a question. Yeah. Um, since it's a word embedding, I'm just wondering, so if the text is just embedded in, you know, in the embeddings, So the word embeddings, or the subword embedding, well, let's assume we, we're dealing with, so this is, this has some enormous pre-trained left to right language model, right? So let's say, it's like GPT-3, for instance. So GPT-3 has a learned subword vocabulary through sentence piece or whatever algorithm that they used. And when you have a discrete prompt, you're going to select 100 embeddings from the, those pre-trained um, subword embeddings, right? Uh, you're, not training. you're not training anything. Um, so in a continuous prompt, you initialize, say, randomly 100 embeddings, and you backprop into them. So there's no guarantee that those embeddings are going to match up identically with something in your learned subword um, embedding matrix. In fact, that's not going to happen at all. All right, so in the second case, um, we ask you, so, so first of all, um, obviously enumerating all possible discrete prompts is not feasible. Um, so instead, if you have enough of these tasks where you have a discrete prompt and a learned continuous prompt, you could actually treat this as a sequence to sequence problem. So, I mean, one of the components of this answer, like the most basic thing would be you would just turn this into a sequence to sequence problem. Maybe you would fine tune a T5 or something like that to solve this task. So the tricky bit here is what does your objective function actually look like? So here you can imagine you have a sequence of discrete, like a discrete prompt, right, with all the word embeddings, and you're trying to produce a sequence of a hundred continuous valued, uh, sorry, continuous embeddings that do not come from your word embedding matrix. So you can't just naively use the cross entropy loss here in your decoder to solve this problem uh, because your outputs are not like uh, words in the vocabulary. They're rather these continuous vectors. Uh, so th there's many different answers that are acceptable for the loss function. You could have used a regression that like use a square loss or something. You could have treated it as a more like ranking style problem or used a margin loss with some negatives. Um, all of those are acceptable, but you had to specify what loss function you used and um, the cross-entropy loss over the vocabulary is not 
an acceptable solution to this. Um, okay, and then the, the last problem here was kind of regarding the motivation of this. So if you had a model that could take a discrete prompt, transform it into a continuous prompt, what advantages could this possibly have? So one, uh, one advantage of the discrete prompt is of course that it's interpretable, so you actually know based on your specification of the discrete prompt what the task you're trying to solve is and what its characteristics are. Um, but you know from the continuous prompt uh, all the stuff that we talked about in the class that continuous prompts tend to perform much better than discrete prompts across a variety of tasks, right? This prompt tuning paper being one example. So if you had a way to get the interpretability of a discrete prompt but also the performance of a continuous prompt, this would be nice. Um, and another advantage of this approach is that it, if you have a new task, you would just specify how to solve the task in a discrete prompt, like in natural language. It would convert it to a continuous prompt. And if this model actually worked, you wouldn't have to fine tune the, like you wouldn't have to learn a continuous prompt by fine tuning the entire model, right? You could just use Gilbert's model here and just decode from it a test time um, and you get a continuous prompt uh, without doing all the expensive fine-tuning of your um, giant language model. So, uh, yeah, there are, if, assuming this works, and that's a huge if, right, it depends a lot on the size of the data set, the diversity of the tasks that Gilbert was able to collect, but it could have, um, you know, big uh, advantages. All right, let's see here. Okay, any questions on this first problem? from all eight of you. <laughs> all right, so we'll move on to the second question. Um, so this one was basically testing your understanding of the parallelization in a transformer and how that's set up. So in this question, um, Julia has this idea where she's going to uh, compress her sequence length by encoding every block of five tokens using something like BERT into a single vector. So now your input sequence length might be n tokens, but after you apply the segment level aggregation, you now get a sequence of length n over 5, right? You've compressed it into these uh, chunks. And now you're building your transformer on top of this shortened sequence. The problem is if you want to train this model for next word prediction, now your input has n over 5 um, representations, but your output has to be n, uh, right? You want to predict all of the words. And so you run into this issue where at some time step you have a segment that contains the next five words, and if you naively try and predict all five words from that segment, you're actually going to be leaking information about the words that are already within the segment. So um, if you do this naively, like in a normal transformer, it's just not going to work. Um, and there are many possible solutions to this, this problem. The um, second question asks you for one, but the easiest by far. Note that we specifically said computational efficiency is not a concern, so this always implies that there's some like dumb, easy solution that you could do. And one approach would just simply be to not parallelize the uh, model at all. So here, uh, every single example in a batch could be associated with just one word prediction, like just the next word, not a bunch of words in parallel. And so, for example, if I had, I guess I didn't give an example sentence, but this sentence, how would you modify Julia's approach? Um, so here, these five words would be uh, encoded into one chunk, and maybe approach to properly train a this other block of five words would become another chunk. And let's say I wanted to predict language. Um, so one example, I could just feed in these two segment representations into the transformer and have it predict language, and that's it. There's no parallelization where I also try and predict model for next word prediction using like the 
um, masking of the loss function because that runs into the issues in the previous uh, sub problem. Um, so if I wanted to predict model now, I would uh, have a new example where I feed in this chunk and then this chunk and then this partial chunk with language also encoded with BERT and then have it predict model. So here I'm not leaking any information about the, um, if I did this naively and let's say I had these chunks here approach to properly train a language model for next word prediction and if I was trying to predict the word language, right, or any of the words in this chunk, I might be leaking information if I do them all at once. Okay, um, there are probably some other solutions, uh, which is, you know, making this a challenge to grade, but uh, this was the easiest one. Um, yeah, and several of you suggested some interesting masking strategies to prevent the leakage. Um, I don't think any of them works, but uh, we, if you want to argue with us, you can submit regrade requests afterwards. Do you have a question? No? Okay. Um, all right. So the third question was a little, sorry, the third subproblem here was a little bit different. So uh, she's moved on from next word prediction and is now on this task of next segment prediction. So here you're given a sequence of the segment representations, the same input as in the first uh, two subproblems. But this is now a retrieval task. So, given the sequence of uh, sequence, re sorry, the sequence of segment representations, retrieve the representation of the next segment from a huge set of all possible five-word segments in the training data set. Um, and this is actually a pretty trivial retrieval problem. You just need some way of encoding your segment representation sequence, and you could have just said. You take the transformer, uh, the model here from question 2.1 and take the final hidden state or something at the top layer as a, a query representation. Or you did some pooling and you averaged all of the representations, whatever. So you have some query representation. And similarly, you embed all of the candidate segments using some function. One easy one would just be to use BERT as in the uh, problem description. So now you have a query representation, you have all of these uh, possible key representations from your candidate set, and you can just train this model to maximize the dot product between the query and the correct next segment and minimize the dot product between the query and uh, all of the negative segments. So this is just a standard uh, retrieval setup. There are many ways you could set up the objective function. You could use a margin loss. You could treat it as a classification problem and um, uh, basically say that there's one correct segment and all of the other ones are incorrect. So just use a cross entropy loss and train a classifier over either the entire training set as negatives or some randomly sampled set of negatives. Um, whatever works, but this is basically just testing if you had understood the um, retrieval style models in Realm and DTR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in practice you would never do that. Uh, we would accept that answer here though. Uh, in practice, you you might want to sample uh, like a much smaller set of negatives and then use the cross entropy loss. All of these losses will roughly do the same thing. Okay, um, so the third question was uh, proved quite tricky, um, although the, the answer is quite simple. So. Here, this was all testing your understanding of all the tokenization stuff, uh, approaches that we talked about and also just computing the probability using a language model. So we were asking you, you have two models, one of which uh, LMB is just a word level language model, uh, nothing fancy about this. 
But LMA is slightly more complicated. It randomly samples a segmentation of like characters, bytes, words, and subwords of a given input sequence. And then uh, it's trained to do next word prediction, right? So here you have this added, um, sorry, next token prediction, I guess would be more accurate. So here you have this added weirdness of having this randomness from the segmentation. Um, and the question is asking you, if you have some held out sentence, like uh, language models are stupid, how do you compute the probability of the sentence using both of these models? So LMB is quite trivial. I, almost all of you got this correct. You just said, you know, we can decompose the probability of the sentence using the chain rule and our language model is giving us these conditional probabilities. We can just multiply them or add their log probability or whatever to get the uh, overall probability of the, the sentence. And many of you said this is exactly what we do for LMA as well, which is not true. Um, so remember that in LMA, this sentence, language models are stupid, can be segmented using a ton of different tokenizations, right? And so what, uh, if you were using the chain rule and so on, you first have to pick a segmentation before you can actually compute the probability. And if you wanted to compute the probability of the sentence, you would actually have to sum over all possible segmentations of the sentence, language models are stupid. So of course this is, um, completely impractical in, in practice, especially for a, a setup like this where the tokenization could include bytes and characters and subwords and so on. But if you wanted to compute the exact probability of the sentence, you would have to sum over all possible um, segmentations of the sentence. So it was a fairly simple problem, but uh, ended up being pretty tricky as well. All right. Um, oh. Is that the contrastive learning scheme? I assume this is about the retrieval uh, question. Yeah, so um, that when you have the negative examples and you're trying to maximize the, uh, the dot product between uh, query and the correct one and minimize the uh, dot product between the query and the negatives, you're doing uh, contrastive learning. Okay, so the last question was fairly straightforward. Um, so here you essentially had uh, a Korean sentence, you had a Google Translate version of that Korean sentence, and you also had a ground truth English translation of that Korean sentence done, written by an expert translator. Um, so we, the, the wording of this problem was a little bit vague uh, in that we said you have a large parallel data set of novels paired with their English translations, but we did not explicitly um, define parallel. So some of you took this to mean you have sentence aligned. Um, actually, most of you thought that's what it meant, which is fine. Uh, that's not actually what we meant. We actually wanted you to say you need to do the alignment first, but uh, it's fine. That, that was a, a wording issue. Um, so assuming you have sentence aligned uh, translations, this is just a, a fairly straightforward sequence to sequence setup with byte T5. So your input would be the um, original Korean sentence. Uh, some separator token and the uh, Google Translate version of that um, Korean sentence and your output would just be the ground truth uh, translator version of that Korean sentence. So if you said that, you got full credit. Uh, we did not take off points if you uh, did not say anything about the alignment. I also realized I didn't even talk about alignment algorithms in the class. Um, so yeah, that was another reason why we didn't um, pick up points. And this, this question was pretty straightforward. There's obviously many human evaluations you could have chosen. If you got expert Korean translators to read the outputs of the model and judge them on some scale, that was acceptable. You could have also gone with automatic metrics. So for example, you computing the blue score of your model uh, with regard, uh, with the references being the translator's outputs and comparing that to the blue score of Google Translate itself, um, that would tell you if you're actually improving with your model over Google Translate. Okay, so yeah, again, you can, oh yeah, go ahead. 
So your references are the human written English translations that time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you don't know about this original novel, right? The, the one that motivated you to do all of this in the first place. Um, you don't have a translation for that, but you can use this data set uh, to get references to evaluate your model. Yeah, uh, for any translation task, you want to be looking at the blue score. Um, remember, like blue score was designed for the case where you have multiple translations, um, and so recall-based methods are don't really make sense in that, that context. All right, so yes, again, you should have your grades maybe within a week or so, um, but hopefully this gives you some rough idea of the, the answers here. Um, we're happy to discuss these more um, in office hours if you want. All right, so let's get to the uh, topic of the day, which is not this, parsing, right. So, um, Last time we talked about psycholinguistics uh, and how humans may or may not have some sort of grammar in their brains that's allowing them to parse sentences and figure out the most likely interpretation of a given sentence in, in cases of ambiguity. And now we're going to talk about computational approaches to obtain the syntactic structure of a sentence. Um, so specifically, I mean, Usually in a classical NLP class, like in the classes I have taken, uh, you know, in like 2013 or whatever, we uh, used to spend like maybe a month or six weeks on parsing. Um, so there are different types of parsing. There's constituency parsing, dependency parsing, many different algorithms proposed to do all of these tasks. and. Parsing used to be a lot more important in terms of downstream task performance in NLP as well. Now, there, it definitely has its uses, but uh, it's not, um, it, it's very clear that the importance of syntactic parsing has diminished significantly with the introduction of uh, neural network language models and so on. So if you look at a transformer, right, it doesn't have any explicit hierarchical structure uh, modeled in the, the attention or anything like that. Everything is learned over this flat sequence of words. And we know that these models are inducing some sort of hierarchical structure, but it's unclear to what degree those correlate with linguist-defined um, notions of syntax. So the question we're, we're going to focus on here is, assume we have a grammar handed to us. We'll talk a little bit at the end about how to get a grammar, um, but assuming we have a grammar, how can we use it to get a tree structure, a parse of any given sentence? Um, so to make it more concrete, given the sentence, a mouse eats a cat, we might want to produce a tree that looks like this. So the root of the tree, this S, means this is a sentence, um, and this noun phrase spans the words a mouse, right? So this is a determiner, this is a noun. Together they form a noun phrase. A noun phrase put together with a verb phrase is one of the rules in our grammar that leads to a sentence. The verb phrase here is eats a cat. Um, and so if we are given just the sentence a mouse eats a cat and a grammar that tells us how to combine various types of words together, how do we form this overall tree and how do we score different possible trees that lead to the same sentence. So, you know, an obvious question here is why, why are we even talking about this? So historically, um, features derived from these tree structures have been very useful to solve downstream tasks. So, for example, knowing that mouse here is uh, the head of the main noun phrase of the sentence could be a useful feature for doing some sort of classification task or translation tasks or something like that. Um, nowadays, our neural network models pick up on a lot of this kind of stuff uh, in, inside the vectors that they're learning. So 
um, you don't see much or any gain anymore by just naively uh, adding features into the uh, neural network about like syntactic roles and constituent types and so on. So that's not to say that it's never helpful. There have been papers that, uh, even recent papers that show that you can integrate syntactic features into neural network models um, for different tasks and get, get some small improvements. But uh, it's unclear how long that will last. Maybe as these models scale up more and more, there won't be any benefit anymore for downstream tasks. But there are other use cases of parsing. So one really important one is, imagine you want to extract all noun phrases from a corpus, right? Or all of some type of phrase. Um, like in this case, you probably don't care about a mouse or a cat. But in cases where you're doing entity-focused um, NLP, so you might want to know, you know, what are all of the ways in which uh, President Biden has been referred to in the New York Times over the past year, right? So you might want to extract all noun phrases that include a reference to Joe Biden and then do some analysis on that. Uh, and one of the ways that you want to do this kind of chunking in, of text into phrases is by using features derived from, from a parser. These are very useful when, when do, making these distinctions. Um, we also had a lecture about probe tasks, right? That's another way in which uh, these kinds of syntactic uh, parsers have been useful in modern NLP is, so we, we know that we can extract this uh, tree structure from a sentence, do the neural networks also encode this, the same tree structure or not? So we can devise various probe tasks, as we saw in the control probe paper, to uh, measure whether or not the neural models uh, encode like the same relationship between these two words, or uh, does it encode the depth of this word in the tree, or the distance between two words in the tree? Um, we can, we can set up a bunch of interesting probe tasks to measure the neural language model syntactic uh, knowledge. Uh, and of course, it's useful for the psycholinguistics experiments to see if humans are preferring a certain parse um, in the same degree that uh, computational models are. Okay, so let's get into some details. Um, this might be familiar to many of you who have taken a formal languages class. Um, so when we're talking about grammars here, we're talking specifically about context-free grammars, which have some distinct characteristics. So um, you're going to have some set of non-terminal symbols. So in, in the case of parsing, your non-terminals are going to be the constituent types that go in the, um, the inner nodes of the tree. So for example, NP, VP, these are examples of non-terminal nodes. And terminal nodes are the actual words themselves. So the words are the building blocks of the tree. You uh, can write rules over the uh, words, which the, the simplest type of rule is essentially a part of speech rule. So mouse is a noun, right? So here you would have a rule that's like n, um, n goes to mouse or something like this. Um, so this is one type of rule that you can have in your grammar. And so here you have, you know, determiner goes to A, verb goes to eats, determiner goes to A, noun goes to cat. These are just the basic rules of, that are being used in this particular instance. Um, and so you can imagine you have a ton of these rules for all of the uh, items in your vocabulary. But there's also um, a higher up set of rules that explain how to compose different non-terminal symbols together. So you can see here, a noun phrase here is composed of a determiner and a noun. Both of these are not terminal symbols, right? They themselves are, uh, they result in terminals when certain rules are applied to them. So you basically have these, these rules in which you have a non-terminal on the left-hand side, and you have either a terminal on the right-hand side or you have 
some uh, either multiple non-terminals, one or more non-terminals on the right-hand side as well. You also have a start symbol, um, which is a member of the set of non-terminals. So let's look at an example to maybe make this more clear. So in this grammar, it's very simple. We have this rule, S uh, goes to NP, VP. So a sentence is form, uh, formed by a noun phrase and a verb phrase in that order. These, all three of these are non-terminals. We have this rule, which is noun goes to dog. So this is non-terminal to terminal. And then we have this rule, a noun phrase is formed by a determiner, adjective, and noun. Um, so this is a non-terminal uh, becoming, uh, being formed by three uh, other non-terminals. So in order to use the algorithms that we're gonna talk about in this lecture, we actually need to uh, do a conversion of this grammar into um, a more constrained one, which is called the Chomsky normal form. And I, by constrained, I mean uh, these rules uh, need to follow some, um, some conventions. First of all, they can either be of this form, which is uh, non-terminal to a single terminal, or this form, where you have a non-terminal that is formed by two non-terminals. So this rule here violates the Chomsky normal form because it has three non-terminals on the right-hand side. But it's very easy to convert this kind of rule into uh, one that actually follows uh, the, the convention here. Um, so we can see that here. All we do is make up a new non-terminal, which subsumes two of the non-terminals in the first rule. And then we can write the same rule as um, now two different rules, right? Uh, so this, this is a, uh, it might seem simple, but you'll see why it's necessary. When we start building a chart, you're always gonna be considering two cells of the chart at the same time, so you, for computational reasons, want your grammar to only consider a max of two different non-terminals when forming a single non-terminal. Okay, so this was just all to say that you're going to get a grammar eventually where the rules are of the form non-terminal to two non-terminals or non-terminal uh, is formed from a terminal. That's, that's all I'd say. Okay, so give it to perform the task of parsing, we uh, are given a sentence and we're given this grammar in the Chomsky normal form and we're trying to search through the space of all possible parses that are valid for that sentence, meaning that the S token that is produced from the parse spans the entire sentence using the rules that are uh, in the grammar. And we want to find either any valid parse or all valid parses or the most probable parse. So we'll talk about the third one a bit at the end um, with uh, probabilistic grammars. So there are basically two approaches that you can approach uh, two approaches that you can use to perform parsing. Um, so there's a bottom-up approach where you start from the uh, leaves of the tree, the actual words themselves, and you try and apply rules to combine together uh, different words until you're able to get to the top of the tree and form this S symbol, which indicates that you've completed the, uh, and it spans the entire tree. Or you can do this top down, meaning you start with the S symbol and then you expand out a bunch of rules and hopefully you find one parse that eventually spans all of the words in your sentence. So what are the pros and cons of each of these approaches? Does anyone um, think they would prefer a bottom up approach or a top down approach? So yeah, I mean, top down is guaranteed to give you something that at least has an S symbol, right? The downside of top down is that you're going to explore a lot of possible parses that have no way of covering your, uh, your the, the words in the sentence, right? So there's a trade off. With bottom up, you might be exploring things that while they actually cover the words in your sentence, 
they have no way of eventually producing an S at the top. In top down, you, you know you're starting with the S, but you don't know if you're gonna cover all the words in the sentence. So this is a trade-off. Um, the algorithm we're gonna discuss today is a bottom-up parser. So it starts from the words and tries to incrementally form these constituents or phrases and combine those together to eventually spin the whole sentence. Okay, and one thing to mention is that here I said we might want to find any valid parse or all valid parses, and you might be thinking how often is it that there are multiple valid parses for a given sentence? In actuality, this happens all the time. Uh, probably the most striking examples are in cases with explicit syntactic ambiguity. So here we have different types of ambiguities. Attachment ambiguity, we eat sushi with chopsticks, so here, the with chopsticks, you're not sure, I mean, in the context, it makes sense, right? You are the one with chopsticks and you are eating the sushi. It's not like the sushi has chopsticks and you're eating the sushi while it's like holding chopsticks, right? That's, that's not plausible, but that's uh, ambiguity in the sentence, right? Uh, a famous one, I shot an elephant in my pajamas, right? So, um, <laughs> Uh, was the elephant wearing your pajamas or were you wearing pajamas when you shot the elephant? Um, there's also scoping ambiguity. So southern food store. Is the store selling food from the south or is the store located in, in the south um, and it's selling food? Um, what about this one? The puppy tore up the staircase. I have to admit I didn't read this one. So not sure what the Oh, 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 right, 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 right. So the puppy, I guess if it was really strong, could have torn up the staircase <laughs> or it could have like ran up the staircase, I guess is the yeah. Um All right. The chicken is ready to eat. Oh, this is interesting. So this could be the chicken is ready to eat its food, or it could be it's been cooked enough and now other people can eat the chicken, right? So that, that's interesting too. Um, okay, so anyway, there's lots of these interesting examples where you could have multiple valid parses. They're all grammatical, but one interpretation is to be preferred based on the um, your like common sense and world knowledge and knowledge of the context. Um, yeah, so for that elephant in my pajamas one, the uh, next sentence here was how he got into my pajamas, I'll never know. So that clears up the ambiguity if, if it existed. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about the CKY algorithm, um, which is a bottom-up parser. So given a grammar and a sentence, you can apply this algorithm to find uh, all or at least, uh, yeah, all valid parses of the sentence. So I will just explain this, al yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so we'll talk about those uh, after we go through this example. A PCFG is where you have a grammar like this one, but each rule is associated with a probability as well. And so this allows you not only to find all valid parses, but also to find the most probable parse, which is usually what you're interested in. Okay, but we'll start with this. Um, I think the best way to explain this uh, algorithm is through example. So let's say we have this grammar. So we have uh, seven rules that are of the form non-terminal to two non-terminals. And then we have uh, eight rules where we have a non-terminal that is going to a terminal, right? So you can see here that um, there is some ambiguity already in these rules. I, the word I can form uh, either a noun phrase or a pronoun. Um, I, I mean, I'm not sure this is how a normal grammar would do this. I'd probably I is always a pronoun, but this is just for sake of example. So there is already the word I will give you two different possible um, uh, non-terminals. Yeah. Oh, uh, I guess it, it might mean possessive pronoun or something like that. Um, yeah, 
don't quote me on that. <laughs> so you can look up the meaning of uh, all of these different constituent types in uh, the Penn Tree Bank manual. They have, I think, like 40 something different constituent types. Um, yeah, but it's hard to remember. Okay, so let's take our sentence, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. The first thing you do in this algorithm is you form a chart that looks like this. So each cell in the chart corresponds to a span of the sentence. So this cell over here spans just a single word, I. Um, this cell here spans, I shot. Uh, let's say this cell here spans just the word shot. This, this cell here spans shot in. Um, and your goal is to uh, fill up this chart incrementally from this first level, which corresponds just to the words, then to the next level, which corresponds to all two word chunks, this level, all three word chunks, four word, five word, six word, and this cell, the top right cell, is the only one that spans the entire sentence. So you want uh, to fill in this cell with uh, basically the uh, S symbol, which would indicate that you're able to parse this whole sentence. So the top right here is the root of the tree. So if we were doing top-down parsing, we would start with an S here and then try and fill this chart uh, going uh, top down, but we are going to start with these uh, leaf nodes here. So the very farthest uh, cells from the root, that's where we start. So the first level here corresponds to words, and we can easily fill these in using the rules that we have that go from non-terminal to terminal. So if you look at this, only one uh, cell here, I, has multiple possible derivations, uh, multiple non-terminals, because there's some ambiguity here. Um, but all the other ones just map to one um, single non-terminal. So very easy, we've completed our first, uh, first level of the chart. Now let's move on to the two word phrases. So I shot, shot in, an elephant, elephant in, in my, in my pajamas. So this, this cell here spans the phrase, I shot. Um, and here we are looking to combine the, uh, the words, the, sorry, the cells that, all the cells that could, all the two cells that could be combined to form this one cell, the rules, the non-terminals inside, can we use our grammar to form a non-terminal from those two cells? Uh, but before we get to that, uh, just to make sure you all understand the concept of the chart, what does this cell here spin? Uh, sorry, oh, oh, yes. So shot an elephant in mine, right? Um, this phrase is, uh, is spanned by this, this cell. So hopefully that's clear. All right, so let's get back to this cell. Uh, our goal is, so we know that there's only two possible cells that uh, are relevant for filling in this uh, blue cell here. That's I and shot, the two individual cells, the, the words uh, of I shot here. Um, so we're going to look at all possible combinations of non-terminals that you can form from these two cells. So I have NP, VBD, VBD is like past tense verb. So noun phrase, uh, past tense verb, or pronoun and uh, verb. So if we look in our grammar, we see that we do have, uh, we actually have none of these. So we have no rule that produces NP uh, VBD or PRP VBD. So we actually can't form any non-terminal from these two um, cells here. So let's move on. For this case, um, we're asking the question, do we have any non-terminals that produce, that are formed from VBD and determiner? So looking at this list here, we do not again. Um, so hopefully we'll get one eventually. Here we have an elephant. So we have determiner and NP, and we actually do have a rule here that uh, we can form a noun phrase from a determiner and a noun phrase. 
So we can actually fill in this cell with NP now. We're able to form a noun phrase. Um, and so uh, we can fill in the rest of the chart in this way. We see that my pajamas, this uh, possessive pronoun, um, and NP is also a rule uh, that uh, forms a noun phrase. So we can fill in this whole second level of the chart, and you see that we have four cells where we were unable to even find any rule that could combine those two things. Um, but we also have these kind of obvious ones, an elephant and my pajamas, which are clearly noun phrases and should be, should be marked as such. So let's go to the third level. Here things get a little more interesting because there are actually multiple combinations of cells that can produce this, uh, this um, phrase, I shot an. So I could take the cell corresponding to I and the phrase corresponding to shot an, or I could take the phrase I shot and the phrase an, right? In either case, I am not going to be able to produce a non-terminal because there's always going to be this null in one of those cells. So there's no way that I can form I shot an using the rules in my grammar. So let's move on to this one. Um, shot an elephant. Is there a way I can produce a non-terminal in this cell? Yeah, so I have a VBD associated with shot, and I have an NP associated with an elephant. And so this, this rule here is going to form a VP. And in the other split, shot an and elephant, I have a null here, so I can't form anything. So this VP is going to be the only one that I can form here. So now I've formed this three-word phrase, verb phrase, shot an elephant. Uh, similarly, uh, at this cell, I can form a prepositional phrase in my pajamas in combined with this NP. All right, so uh, now at the fourth level, what are my possible options here for I shot an elephant? Yeah. No, in is, uh, it's, it's kind of annoying, but it's used for preposition like the, um, so PP is a prepositional phrase. Uh, I guess they didn't use P for whatever reason for the, just the preposition they used in. But there's actually, I think, uh, for different prepositions, some of them have their own non-terminal. I think two is one, two. It really depends on the, the tree bank, but... Yeah, it's kind of strange. So in here, you can see a prepositional phrase is formed by in and a noun phrase. In is a preposition. All right, so let's move on to this one. Um, what are my possible options here? So, yeah. Yeah, so I and shot an elephant, right? This is the one that I have an NP and a VP. So this forms an S. So this is good. I have PRP, VP, oh, that's not one. Um, so that's all I can form with I and shot an elephant. The other two are null, so I can't form anything else. Um, so here I formed an S. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any rules where S is also on the right-hand side here. So this S is probably not going to be useful in the future, but nevertheless, I was able to form something. In here, I was able to form an NP. So this was elephant in my pajamas. Um, this NPPP, you can see, is also a rule. So that was used to form this noun phrase. Um, so we can go on to the next level. And now things get a little interesting with um, this phrase for an elephant in my pajamas. So what are the different uh, things to consider here? Yeah, so are you referring to this? So this determiner, an, and this should be associated with this NP for elephant in my pajamas. This is associated with this rule, so I can clearly form one NP this way. What about this case, though? An elephant combined with this prepositional phrase, in my pajamas, I get an NPPP, which is also a noun phrase. So this cell is interesting because now I actually have 
two potential noun phrases that I can form using different splits of this uh, five word phrase. So I have to consider both of these moving forward. When we get to the PCFG, we can see that if we have this case where we have two um, of the same type of non-terminal, we can prune the lower probable one because they're the same type of noun phrase. Uh, so we don't have to consider both of these. All right, so when we get to here, now we have VBD that can be combined with either the first NP or with the second NP. Um, so, and we also have this verb phrase, shot an elephant, which can be combined with the prepositional phrase in my pajamas. So we can form three different verb phrases in this cell. And finally, when we get to the root, we can combine any of these VPs with this NPI to form a set uh, S, right? S, NP, VP. Um, so these are the three possible ways in which I could form an S. So now I've formed three valid parses of the sentence using the grammar that I had. Um, and yeah, this is basically an instance of the CKY algorithm. So now one question is, I filled in this chart and I see that I have three valid parses. How do I actually recover the tree structure from these, uh, each of these S symbols? So does anyone have any ideas here? If you're familiar with dynamic programming algorithms, there's, um, you know, it, it should be fairly straightforward. So one thing I haven't shown you in this chart is that every time you make a decision on something to add into the cell that is not a null, you also store back pointers to the two cells that were used to combine the the non-terminals into this uh, new non-terminal. So from this S, I'm gonna have back pointers to this NP and to each of these VP3, VP1, VP2, VP3. I can just basically follow the back pointers back to the leaves to reconstruct the full tree, tree structure. So that's, that's how we do this. Um, that is also the answer to this, this question. Um, and so the runtime of this algorithm is actually cubic in the length of the sentence. Uh, we essentially have three nested loops when we're filling in this chart. Um, so I'm not gonna go into that more, but it's something to be aware of, especially in the uh, neuralized formulations of these algorithms that it can be very slow to fill in the chart, yeah. Yeah, this one? Sorry, which cells specifically are you referring? Um, so like you combine the VP with like this one? That one, yeah, with VP right. at the bottom. But then the other option is the VP with right, these. The right. So, so this cell here, it spans the text, shot an elephant in my pajamas. So any combination of cells that I look at here has to span the same text. So you can see here that this VP spans shot an elephant, which means to form something in this cell, I need something that spans the remainder of that, which is in my pajamas. And that cell is only spanned by this, this cell over here. So I have, sorry, this, this cell over here. So I have to combine this only with this to, if my goal is to fill in this uh, cell in the chart. You can see the same thing with this, right? Shot is spanned by this, this cell. And then I need something to spin an elephant in my pajamas. The only candidates occur in this cell. All right, so um, now the question is, let's say I have these three parses, how do I find the best one? And we can translate this into, how do we find the most probable parse? So in a probabilistic context-free grammar, as I mentioned before, all of the rules, uh, so all of like these things, 
are associated with a probability. And you can estimate these probabilities using tree banks. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But if you assume that you have these probabilities, then you can just compute the probability of any parse by multiplying the rule probabilities that make up the, the parse. So you can multiply the probability of each of the rules that are used in the formation of the, the parse to get its total probability. Then you can compare the probability of uh, S1, S2, and S3 and pick the most probable one. So it's actually quite simple. Um, so let's take a look at an example. Uh, so here, I just randomly put some probabilities next to each rule. Um, and if you're given something like this, it, you can go ahead and fill in your chart with both the uh, non-terminals as well as the probability of getting to this non-terminal at this point in the chart. So the first level, you would just copy the probability from the grammar. Let's say we're over here and we formed an NP. So now we want to compute the probability of this NP. Uh, how would we do that? So 0.9 times 0.8 gives us these individual rule probabilities. But there's a third rule, right, which is NP is formed by determiner and NP. So you were close, but you have to also consider the probability of the composition rule that is used to combine these individual probabilities together. So you can see how this S, then the probability of this S would just be the product of all of the rules that were used to, to make up this uh, cell. So as usual, when we're dealing with a lot of multiplications of probabilities, we're going to do this in the log space, um, not in the raw probability space to avoid underflow issues. Um, so we can continue filling out this table in the log space. Now when we get to a situation where we have two different NPs, um, there is no need for me to consider both NPs here, right? If I have two NPs, I can pick the most probable one and go on with filling out the parse and it'll make no difference because these are both the same uh, constituent type, the same non-terminal, and so it makes no difference if the NP is formed one way or the other in, in this algorithm, right? It's only important that there's an NP in the chart. So I can use the probability of each of these two to prune the lower probability one from the chart and I don't have to consider it if my goal is to only find the most probable parts. So uh, if I have this situation where NP1 is uh, less probable than NP2, I can just not consider NP1 in the remainder of this chart because NP1 will never be part of the most probable parts. Okay, so similarly with this cell where I have two VPs, um, I don't need to store both of them. I can just store the most probable one and then I get the most probable S out of uh, all of the S's that I was considering. So this is how you apply the CKY algorithm with a probabilistic grammar. Very straightforward. Um, you are just doing this additional pruning based on the uh, probabilities if you have multiple ways of coming up with the same non-terminal symbol. So the back pointers look something like this. Um, you can use this to recover the whole tree. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a cell with, uh, say, like this one, where you have two different um, non-terminals, you have to keep both of them. The you can only do the pruning when you have multiple ways of getting the same non-terminal symbol. Okay, <clears throat> so there are some issues with the way that I've explained this grammar. One is quite clear that each rule's probability is independent of the entire rest of the tree, right? So you might not want this, right? You might want the probability of a rule to actually be contextualized within the context of this tree. Maybe some rules are much less likely to occur given that some other word occurred in this tree Oh, in the sentence or something like that. So, you know, like John saw the man with the hat versus John saw the moon with the telescope, right? Here, there, the modifier with the hat 
uh, clearly attaches to man in this first sentence, but attaches to John in the second sentence, right? John is using the telescope. John is not seeing the man with a hat. So um, the rule probabilities for these things will be the same in both of these cases using the grammar that I've explained. But if the rule probabilities were conditioned on, say, the fact that the verb here was saw, then maybe you would want them to change a lot, right? Because you can't see anything with a hat. So maybe that particular attachment should have a lower probability in this case. Um, so there are variants of these grammars that try and add more and more information about like different words in the sentence or different positions of the word in the sentence into the grammar, the rules themselves, um, which uh, it, some, some methods, for example, are uh, your grammar can include what the parent of the current um, NP, the non-terminal, is in the, in the tree. It can include lexical information. So instead of having a general VP non-terminal, you can make a VP for every single verb in your uh, data set. And maybe they behave differently or they have different probabilities based on their semantics. Um, you can also parameterize these rules with vectors and use neural networks to learn representations of the rules. Um, there's, there's many different things you can do. The best parsers now are neural network uh, parsers as well. So let's take a look uh, at this uh, concept of lexicalization. So here we have a uh, grammar that uh, a simple grammar where we're just forming a tree of this uh, sentence, a lawyer questioned the witness. Um, <clears throat> so if we were going to lexicalize this grammar, we would have separate non-terminals for uh, like NP lawyer. Here lawyer is called the head word of this noun phrase. And so we have a different non-terminal that's only used whenever lawyer is the head word of the noun phrase. See, here we have a different one where witness is the head word. So these two noun phrases are different non-terminals in our grammar. Um, and so this gives you the ability to change the probabilities of these rules depending on the words that are uh, within the, the uh, phrases. However, there are some issues with this kind of approach. Can anyone think of one? Exactly. So uh, by doing this, you blow up the size of your grammar by a lot, right? So where before I just had one uh, NP, now I have potentially thousands or tens of thousands of NPs, each associated with a different head noun, right? And so when I'm estimating the rule probabilities, which I usually do by just counting occurrences of the rules in a tree bank that someone has labeled, I'm going to run into sparsity issues where Maybe I don't see that many NPs where witness is ahead. So I have a bad estimate for the rule probabilities that involve this, uh, this particular NP. OK, so just to wrap up, um, the final piece of the puzzle here is uh, how do we actually get these probabilities? And so there have been a lot of effort put into creating tree banks, so basically People will take some sentences, they will train linguists to annotate these trees from the sentence. Um, so this is obviously a very challenging process. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Um, but if you do this, you can create some sort of like ground truth trees for you know thousands or tens of thousands of sentences and use this to uh, estimate the rule probabilities by just counting up how many times did the linguists use like this NP witness goes to uh, is formed by determiner and witness or something like that? Um, so it's similar to the what we talked about with n-gram models, right? If you have this labeled data set of trees, which are all formed by these rules, you can just count up the occurrences of these rules and normalize and get the probabilities of each rule. Um, but you know, it might be more interesting to assume that you don't actually have access to a tree bank and see if you can get these rules anyway. 
Um, so one algorithm to do this is called the inside-outside algorithm, which some of you might have uh, heard of or used in different contexts. But here, if you have a grammar, you can randomly initialize the probabilities, and you can compute trees using these random probabilities as, as if they were real. Um, then you can essentially use EM um, and then see like what are the expected counts use of the trees that you induce given these random probabilities. You can re-estimate the probabilities using the trees that you've induced and then keep iterating through this process and hopefully you'll converge to a pretty reasonable set of probabilities. That said, uh, it's much more reliable to rely on the um, supervised tree banks for estimating these rules, but that's not really possible for low resource languages or domains that uh, may be very different than the standard newswire text that is annotated in these tree banks um, today. All right, so any questions uh, before we end? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so the question is about the grammatical correctness of the tree banks. Yeah, in general, the tree banks are done over like news articles and things like that, where you would expect most sentences, if not all, are going to be grammatically correct. But that's why when you try and apply a parser trained on one of those tree banks to something like Twitter, it just it doesn't work that well. And so there have been efforts to make tree banks of things like tweets, which you can imagine is very challenging. Like, what do you do with people like repeating letters or using hashtags or emojis? And all of that needs to be part of the grammar. Um, so you can imagine how painful that might be. But Parsers trained on these tree banks do work a lot better for, um, I think one of our faculty, Brendan O'Connor, actually made some resources for, like linguistic uh, resources for tweets in particular, uh, like part of speech tagging and, and so on. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it is not easy to generalize if you train a parser on grammatical text to if, uh, text that might be ungrammatical or just in a completely different uh, style of writing. Yeah, so the, the question is the rules here are static rules. They're not created by an algorithm. That's true in all of the stuff that we've talked about here. Um, some of the optional readings for this class involve uh, models in which the grammar itself is learned um, in, in a manner of speaking from the text. Um, so you can imagine instead of having rules which are like static, discrete like this, your rules are instead some composition function that is parameterized by a neural network. Um, you could think of it as just having like one rule which is uh, the output of some neural network and has a lot of different properties. Um, but uh, yeah, there has been work like in the optional readings to induce parse trees from uh, text without any sort of supervision from tree banks um, and without any uh, static rules as well. Uh, but these efforts are still way off from supervised uh, tree banks. OK, great. So. Uh, yeah, I still have not decided the topics for uh, next week, so any further input. I think one lecture will be on dialogue. I'm not sure about the other one. Um, maybe I'll just cancel class. No, don't get your hopes up. <laughs> um, so anyway, if you have suggestions, just dump them into the um, anonymous forum and see you on Monday. <laughs>